Alrighty. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, this lecture, I'm going to talk about introduction to winemaking and the basics of what's going on. Um, this lecture will be the last lecture in our kind of like winemaking uh, unit. Uh, the next unit that we're going to move into is going to be more of the actual wine sensory science. So that's um, kind of the bread and butter of this class. Uh, but like I said, I am required to go over these for you guys. It's kind of the basics, the foundations. So you build an understanding of um, how the wine was made and how it all kind of ties together. So um, which will be very important in, uh, in, you know, in the industry for jobs and, and all that kind of stuff so you would know what you're talking about, basically. It's all related. It's all very important. But um, like I said, this will be the end of this unit. So with that being said, I'm probably going to post some uh, quizzes. For you guys and um, like I said don't worry about the due date or um, well there will be a due date but it's gonna be uh, it's not gonna be due right away you're gonna have plenty of time to do this uh, if you have any problems meeting the due date just let me know email me um, but like I said this class is pretty um, pretty flexible uh, the whole point of this is, is to learn not to punish anyone so anyways that being said we'll just move into this lecture and um, you know if this due dates, assignments, whatever you need to do, I'll send you guys an email and uh, let you know, try to be very clear about what's going on. So don't worry, there will be, there will be further communication about that, so, so don't, don't you worry. Okay, so winemaking, what's the big deal? Is it witchcraft? Is it, you know, fermentation science? What exactly is it? So wine is just fermented grapes. Uh, so very basic, you know, red wine is fermented grape skins, seed, juice, etc. That's called grape must. That's the definition of that, that soupy mixture that ferments in the tank. That's a must. Uh, the skin contact during fermentation is what gives red wine that's that color specifically, uh, of course. White wine is just the fermented juice. On the other hand, um, typically is made from white grape varieties. Uh, however, you can make a white wine from red grapes. You just remove the skins right away, just like you would for a, um, a white grape variety, and ferment the juice from there. And you are able to make a white wine from red grapes as well. Rosé wine can be made um, actually in three different ways, but there's two main ways. Um, you could use red grapes that are crushed and left on the skins for just a couple of hours, and then pressed and fermented. And then uh, you could also just take a finished white wine and blend some red wine into it to give it kind of a pink color. Um, here is a clip on YouTube, kind of like how wine is made. It goes through a really nice kind of short animated process. If it helps you if you're a visual learner like me, um, that helps a lot. So feel free to click on the link. Um, and you can watch that video. So for wine, there are uh, some basic steps, right? First, of course, and I have more slides going over this as well. So first, of course, you'll need to harvest the grapes, you know, um, you have to crush and destem them as part of the processing. It goes through a primary fermentation where the sugar is converted into alcohol. Once that's done, the skins are removed and it's pressed. It's, the skins are pressed and all of the, you know, new young wine is being removed from the skins. The skins are pretty much just dry little pellets at this point. It gets spread out into the vineyard. Secondary fermentation occurs, which is the transfer a transformation of acids. Uh, racking, so racking is just a fancy word for all of the sediment and junk settling to the very bottom of the tank or the barrel um, gets left behind and the, the clean good stuff gets pumped off the top and then all that junk gets cleaned out and basically thrown away. Um, barrel aging is very standard for red wine, very common. Most people will age anywhere between 12 to 24 months, sometimes longer, it depends. Of course, as we found out last lecture, there's a huge variety of oaks that could be used um, in, in wine for aging. Blending will typically occur after that, uh, and then filtration, which removes all of the organisms from the wine and makes it sterile, makes it clean, also helps with the clarity. And then uh, bottling, of course, where you put the product in a sealed container and then it is sold either at the winery or at a mark in the mass market or whatever from there. Those are the basic steps. So we're, we're going to dive into these, so don't worry if that was too uh, too much of just the surface level for you. So for red wine, like I said, harvest, destemming and crushing, fermentation typically happens in a very large stainless steel tank like this. Uh, pressing, this is a um, basket press. 
it kind of works. You screw it down and it pushes this like flat mantle up against the skins and then the you know resulting wine or juice comes from this bottom valve. Then it can go through malolactic fermentation. It's the secondary fermentation. No way, we're gonna talk about this more. That can happen in a tank or in a barrel. Blending happens. Uh, maturity, you know, this, these are kind of, you could do these either way, it doesn't have to be in this order. Then there's fining and filtering, and then bottling, of course. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Harvest, okay. So this is, this is bolded because this is important. Grapes are picked at ideal conditions for the desired style of wine. Not all grapes are picked at the same time for, for different styles of wine. It's, it's all completely different. Like white wine, is picked early you know white wine typically doesn't have a high alcohol so we'll do a lower sugar higher acid content resulting in a lower alcohol white wine that's that's the standard but some for some wines there's going to be exceptions of course and for some styles for a red wine the you know the golden ticket or the you know the most common bricks to be harvested that is 24 bricks 24 bricks 25 bricks it gives you a resulting alcohol 14 15 percent ABV. So that's that's kind of the standard. You're doing different styles, harvested at different times. And that's super important because not just because the alcohol content and the sugar and acids, but also the flavors change. You know, if you think about if you ever been to Apple Hill or if you ever been to a farm and you tried to eat fruit from a tree that wasn't ripe yet, it tastes really vegetal. It tastes not sweet. It's you know, it doesn't taste like, say, for example, like an apple, right? You bite an unripe apple, you just get a bunch of acid in your mouth, and it just kind of tastes green. Like, literally, it just tastes like you ate a twig, or like a green twig or something. And as it develops, it starts to develop all these beautiful flavors, like apple blossom, and, the, and kind of the sugars, and the sweet, and then the individual variety of apple flavors. So it's a lot like that with grapes, too. So the earlier you harvest... You're gonna, it's gonna taste like plant matter. Literally, it's just like, think of that really, like, rough, gritty, sour apple. It's like just plant matter. You feel like you're just eating stems. Then it starts to develop into kind of an herbaceousness, kind of the vegetal, tobacco, herbs. So, um, kind of starts to develop. Then you get unripe fruit. So this is for, this is for grapes. This is the sliding scale of flavors, depending on when you harvest. That's kind of green apple, citrus rind, etc. Then you get red fruit developed from there. So red fruit, like say for example, and this is for Cabernet Sauvignon, this was a study done by uh, Linda Basson, who's a legend by the way. Um, so as so you could say that like for red fruit development and Cabernet Sauvignon for those flavors, it would probably be around 24 bricks. That's like, yes, yeah, the golden standard. If you wanted to harvest it a little bit later, it, the flavors would change and you'd get more black fruit, so plum, blackberry, black cherry would be developing as well. If you left it on the vine even longer, like say upwards towards 28, 29, 30 bricks, you're going to get jam. It's going to taste like, uh, you know, like cooked fruit, um, you know, prunes, dates, raisins. So if you are getting those flavors and aromas from a wine, it could be because it was harvested extremely late, or it could be because the acid content's low, which acid drops over time during maturity in grapes. So keep that in mind. So if you are looking for a late harvest wine that tastes like jam, then you're going to harvest it late, of course. If you're looking for a very bright, uh, nice acidity, you're going to probably harvest it earlier. If you're looking for more developed fruits and trying to stay away from like the vegetal flavors, you'll pick it later and then you can water it back or something. So that's kind of, keep that in mind for, you know, people, we, we utilize and manipulate this to get the fruit that we want. Like a lot of people will pick fruit just off of the taste. So that, that is a thing. In addition though, of course you look at sugar content. It, it's related to the resulting alcohol and like I said, the flavors develops, like we just talked. Acid content is very important because um, we think about acid that you taste. The sugar to acid ratio needs to be just right. If you don't have enough acid, the resulting wine will be extremely flabby and kind of just meh, kind of monotoned, too high of acid, and uh, it's going to be too tart for people, or everyone's going to be like, oh, my acid reflux, or something like that. You have to be very careful. It has to be balanced. It has to be balanced. Think of, like, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has been engineered to be the perfect ratio of sugar to um, CO2, like carbon dioxide, you know, bubbles, and acid. So, 
There's a reason that it sells so well. It, it's addicting. Uh, pH. pH is extremely important. Um, I don't know if I've already lectured you guys about pH, but just think about like a fish tank. Think about the pH in your body. If something shifts slightly, everything goes into chaos. So pH for grapes before they're harvested is analyzed to make sure that when it comes time to fermentation, it's the correct stable environment for microorganisms to flourish. So that's, that's why we think about this. So anyways, the main point of this is that the grapes have to be picked at an ideal condition for the desired style of wine. And you have to know what it is for the style so, so you know what's going on. So step two, once it's been harvested, crush and destem. Now this is typically done for red wines. It can be done for some whites and then they're just pressed immediately or um, maybe just after a couple of hours. Um, so yeah, this is typically, you know, the grapes are dumped in this situation that you see here. These have already, be, already been uh, crushed and destemmed. You can see it's just like a massive bin of just berries. It looks like blueberries. Everyone always says, it looks like blueberries. Um, so yeah, it's just a process that helps to um, start to start the maceration process. So that's the extraction of the color. Uh, it's breaking open the berries so the sugars are exposed so we can start them be, to ferment after that. So like I said, after it's been crushed and destemmed, uh, this pile of mush is called must. It's called must. So that's how that works. So after you have crushed and destemmed your fruit, this is for red wine, keep in mind, um, is put your wine into primary fermentation. So primary fermentation is also known as alcoholic fermentation. It's because that is the process of converting sugar to ethanol uh, and carbon dioxide. And another product of that fermentation is heat. Heat is released which helps with the extraction of the colors. Um, it helps to um, help the yeast flourish. If it gets too hot, it gets very stressful, of course. Um, but this is a very critical time that primary flavors are extracted, so all the, all the really nice fruity flavors. Um, tannins are also extracted as well, and that comes from the skins and the seeds of the grape. So that's primary fermentation. That's kind of what goes on there. After your red wine has finished through primary fermentation, then you'll press. So here is a very large basket press. As you can see, um, all of the must has, is in here and it is being drained through this hose down here and there is this massive piece like metal plate up here that will be forced downward onto the skin so to help just extract all the leftover wine every last drop. So um, typically the wine will be fermented completely so there's no sugar, virtually no sugar left over, which is, means dry, dry wine. We want this because if there's any sugar left over, sometimes it can open the gates to spoilage and other things that we really don't want. So that's the, that's the situation there. You can do it with some sugar, but we're going to dive into the chemistry. you got to take my winemaking class um, because I don't want to unload that on the sensory class. So just sticking to the basics here. So you press it. The leftover skins that's left behind, that's called pumice. Uh, trivia, trivia vocabulary right there, it's called pumice. So those leftover skins that are dried after pressing, those get tossed into the vineyard for compost. And then um, you have this fresh young wine that's ready for secondary fermentation. Okay, secondary fermentation. So once you've done converted, converting the sugar to alcohol, now we need to convert malic acid into lactic acid. So, what the heck? A lot of people don't know that red wines and some whites go through secondary fermentation. Everyone knows about primary, but a lot of people talk about secondary. So secondary fermentation is extremely important for a lot of reasons. It's involved with stability. Um, there's a lot of really nasty organisms out there that like to eat malic acid and produce negative flavors and aromas. So it's a, it's a stability as well. But also, a lot of like really pleasant, high award-winning wines um, have gone through secondary fermentation because it creates a softer and creamier mouthfeel in the wine. So it, it's very desirable, okay? Um, so like we said, this in this case, instead of using how we use a yeast for primary fermentation, we actually use a bacteria for malolactic fermentation. And if you ever get confused, think malolactic, the answer is really in the name. Malolactic, the conversion of malic acid to lactic acid. 
and we call this a fermentation even though technically speaking it's not a fermentation it's a decarboxylation reaction because um, it releases co2 in the process so it kind of bubbles like primary fermentation that's why that's why we think of that um, most of the time you'll see secondary fermentation or malolactic fermentations occur in the barrel it does not normally look like this this is just the only photo i could find on the internet <laughs> it's not normally bubbling over like this but in extreme situations if it was just really vigorous it could it's possible um, but yes, happens in the barrel. The barrel just happens to be a really good environment for malolactic fermentation to take place. And um, from there, once that's completed, it gets racked. And, uh, you know, all the bacteria that's dead gets cleaned out. And, uh, and we move on. This is kind of the, this is the chemistry behind what I was telling you guys with the malolactic fermentation. So this is organic chemistry yes if anyone's taken that um, here is a structure of malic acid so as you can see um, this what I have circled here in uh, these little red circles that is a carboxylic acid group so that you can literally see it is a conversion of a compound that has two acid groups to a compound that has only one why is that important it's still it's still you still have a compound well one of those compounds gets released into as carbon dioxide, one of those uh, carboxylic acid groups, is released to CO2. So it literally changes the flavors from like a harsh green apple to yogurt. So they're both acids, two different sensory aspects to them. Okay, so literally malic acid is in green apples, lactic acid is in yogurt and milk. So it really helps them out to feel, it really helps stability. Um, it's just a lot of really good wines are tied to that. Okay, so that's that's for like a red wine, right? Well, most every red wine is put through malolactic fermentation. Some wineries pride themselves on not doing it because it's an ancient way of making wine. Awesome. Um, that's a whole other discussion for later. If you take a white wine through malolactic fermentation, it has a different effect. So I don't know if you guys are familiar, you probably are, with uh, like buttery Chardonnay. That's, that's a huge thing. So, so some people love buttery Chardonnay. It tastes like movie theater popcorn. Pair it with, uh, you know, Alfredo. Pair it with, you know, lobster tail. You know, your sharp scampi. All that wonderful buttery goodness. Um, that is a direct result of secondary fermentation. So what happens, um, if you're a chemistry nerd like me, um, the bacteria actually synthesize citric acid into what's called diacetyl compounds, which um, is are the compounds that produce that buttery flavor and aroma. So the extent of the butteriness depends on um, to sometimes how much citric acid is present in the wine, but also what you'll see is a lot of winemakers will blend. So instead of doing too much butter, they like to have some stainless steel that has not gone through secondary and some that has and has been on oak. So they'll only like, so say you have 800 gallons of Chardonnay, you only barrel down four barrels, so like you could say, I don't know, 15% of that lot, you barrel down and you put through secondary fermentation, it develops buttery, oaky flavors, then you blend it back together. Uh, and that would be a way to kind of uh, manipulate the amount of butteriness that's in the wine. So that's, that's how that happens. That's why some white wines have buttery components. Um, so yeah, now you know. Okay, white wine, on the other hand, is uh, a lot more simple in uh, procedure, but white wine, I will say, is extremely delicate to make. Any type of movements you make is going to affect the flavors and aroma. It's extremely susceptible to oxidation, so like browning, because it is white. It's much more obvious when a white wine starts to brown instead of a red wine. Um, so yeah, the process is simpler, though, in general. Uh, so you have white grapes that are harvested and then they're sent to the press, press immediately to uh, remove the skin, seeds, and stems from the juice. Then you just take the juice and you put that in a tank and you ferment it. Um, typically for white wines, you want to ferment really cold and really slow. It helps to preserve a lot of the flavors and aromas, uh, keeps it really complex, really bright, and um, ends up being a really good product. Anyways, once primary fermentation has been completed, the wine is then racked off, so all of the dead yeast and all the sediment uh, sinks to the bottom of the tank. That white wine is racked off of all that junk 
and then it can be blended, it can be, some of it could be barrel aged if they want to, they can put it through secondary fermentation and create those buttery characteristics like we just talked about if they want to, uh, and then it can pretty much be bottled. White wine is ideal because it's a very fast turnover, you don't have to age it. So if you are looking for, um, you know, something at your winery that's going to give you a profit as soon as possible, white wine is a good way to go. So it's often advantageous as a business to have both white, rosé, and reds. So that way, no matter what, you have new products coming out all the time. So you don't have to wait, you know, two or three years for your new vintage of red to come out. Or if you had to throw out a vintage because of smoke taint, uh, you at least have white wines coming soon that you could put in your wine club and stuff. Uh, I added some pictures of um, just kind of some graphs, or this isn't really a graph, this is just kind of sch a schematic of um, how it happens, the white wine. So like we said, harvest, this is a press, this is a wine being collected at the very bottom in, a, in like a little uh, tray, and it's pumped into a tank. So this is juice, and then uh, it will ferment and clarify, so you can see all of the yeast is sinking to the bottom of the barrel, or would be in the bottom of the tank. Oh, well, okay, this graph doesn't quite make sense, but it's okay. Okay, so fermenting, settling, all the gunk, all the pulp from the juice, adding the yeast, letting it ferment, secondary fermentation. Um, stirring the lees is a stylistic choice. Um, that adds kind of mouthfeel and more creaminess and more complexity. Blending, uh, clarification again, bottling, and selling it to the market. So that's just kind of to give you a grasp of what is going on. For rosés, there's technically, there's, there's more, but three ways that you can make rosé. You can make it with red grapes. Uh, you leave the juice on the skins for a short amount of time to extract just a little bit of color. Then you press it, the juice is fermented, uh, as if it was a white wine, so cold and slow in a stainless steel tank, typically, and then, uh, you know, blended and put on the market. Um, so that's that's one way of doing it. There's also, like we mentioned earlier, you can take a white wine uh, or a white juice and add just a small amount of red wine to give it a blush color. Then there's something called um, saunier, and that is, literally translates to bleeding off. It's... French term, and it's something that a lot of winemakers use to um, help prevent a stuck fermentation. So you literally just tap off some juice from a red wine tank that's been cold soaking, that's been, you know, they haven't started the fermentation yet, but the tank is really cold and they're starting to extract flavors before fermentation begins to just give you that much more time. Because red, red fermentations don't take long. Sometimes they take you know, like a week, and then it, and then it's over. So you want to get the most bang for your buck, the most time on the skins. Um, but anyways, so you can bleed off some of that juice, and you can ferment that separately, and that will have a red color, reddish color, because it's already been extracting um, from the skins. So that's a possibility. So here is another schematic for you guys. Uh, you harvest the grapes. You can crush them. You can wait a couple hours or a few days, depends on how much extraction you want from the skins. Then you press, and then you get that nice beautiful pink color, and then you start fermentation. Pretty, pretty simple. Uh, here's a little bit more on Saunier. Um, like I said, it's to bleed off, which is a reference to um, kind of a classic, classic ailments to people being sick. Uh, they would, they would bleed off, they, they would take some blood out of you to help you get better. I don't understand the science or the reasoning behind that at the time, but um, something about kickstarting your body into into producing fresh blood or new antibodies. I don't. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm sorry. But that is the reference. It means to bleed off. So if it helps you remember, awesome. Uh, this is also a method used to concentrate flavors in a red wine. So when you think about like the ratio of all the skins all the juice in the tank. If you bleed off some of the juice, uh, you have a better ratio, so you're going to have more extraction, uh, more intensity of that wine without having to try to blend anything to it. It's true to the variety. So, like I said, enhances color. It also will enhance the tannin. Just be careful with that. Uh, polymeric pigment, don't worry about that. Phenolics, don't worry about that. It's more for the winemaking class. 
This is just a slide that I borrowed from my, one of my other lectures. So if you are removing a little bit, like 5 to 18 percent, it's very easy. But if you're going to remove a lot, it becomes really hard to manage uh, the must after that because it's just mostly uh, skins at that point. Here's another little chart I stole from Wine Folly um, for, for Sonia. You're welcome to take a, take a look at it. It's also on their website. Uh, yes. There are lots of other styles of wine as well, and they are all made in unique ways. Sparkling wine, uh, personal favorite. So for this one, this is harvested one of the earliest out of all the styles of wines. Harvested very early, slightly unripe to keep the acidity in the wine. Uh, the bubbles that you're tasting in sparkling wine is carbon dioxide. It can be bubbled in directly, uh, but most of the time for higher quality um, sparkling and champagne, it's, it's produced by the yeast during fermentation. So if you made in three different ways, um, there's an ancestral method, a traditional method, and a tank method. And I, you don't have to know like crazy too much about this. This is kind of just more for your information. Uh, for ancestral method, there's a primary fermentation where it's done um, like typically in a tank and it continues about the midway point. Uh, it's filtered and paused so that way there is some kind of some residual sugar in there. Then um, we add some yeast to the bottle and it ferments in the bottle. It's, a, it's producing the carbon dioxide. Then we have a riddling and a disgorging. So the riddling is, you know, they put it on a rack and they twist the bottles. And there's actually some machines that do it like automatically, like they move where they need to go. It's pretty crazy if you ever get to see those. Um, and then they freeze the cap, all, all of the yeast at the very top, and then they disgorge it. They open it really quick and it just shoots that little frozen cap of yeast out and then they bottle it back up really quick and then they sell it. So that's that's the um, ancestral method. Traditional method, um, you have the cuvee, which the wines actually complete their fermentation all the way, their primary fermentation, and then there's blending done and that's kind of your base wine. It's a finished still wine. Then you do a, a tirage, tirage, and that is um, you blend a small amount of sugar and yeast together. And so that way you can do a calculation of exactly how much residual sugar you want and the rate of fermentation. And that math is, has to be very precise because you don't want your bottles to explode. So that uh, has to be very specific. Then the wines will age for a period of time. It can be anywhere from nine months to five years, depending on the quality. Again, with the riddling and disgorging, and then from there you have a dosage, which you can, um, you know, add some sugar to it. There's differing levels of sugar uh, for like the residual at the end. And you can go from there. The uh, riddling is a manipulation done to concentrate the lees at the neck of the bottle. Like I said, it forms that little cap at the very, very top. Uh, it's, that is the riddling process. It's followed by freezing and disgorgement of the lees. So it freezes the cap so that way it doesn't just get all mixed up in the bottle again. You want the sparkling to be as clear as possible. Freeze it, disgorge it, shoot it out of the bottle, and then recap it, and then you're good to go. Then we have the laziest method, but the easiest as well, and that is the tank method. And that is when you take a base wine, so a white wine, any white wine, and you add sugar and yeast, and then it goes to a secondary fermentation. So, um, you know, it develops its own sparkling, its own carbonation. Uh, you can do a secondary fermentation. Wines complete their secondary fermentation in a pressure resistant tank for about 10 days. That's, you need pressure resistance, that way it can hold the CO2 or also start to just release. Kind of like you just leave a soda can open on the counter for a couple hours, it just releases all the CO2. Then it's filtered, and then uh, any extra back sweetening residual sugar that they want is added to it as well. So that's, that's some ways how that's done. Late harvest wines for all my sweet wine drinkers out there. Um, so these, just like the name implies, are harvested very late. And that is ideal because you get higher sugar content in the grapes. 
So as you can see here, like this raisining situation, um, great for late harvest, wonderful. Really cool flavors and aromas develop, lots of complexity. Uh, definitely tastes a lot like honey, like thickness. It's really, really sweet, high sugars. Um, dehydration, of course, makes the sugar content really high. Late harvest wines are not necessarily fortified. That means adding out spirits, adding more alcohol to them. So they don't necessarily have a high alcohol. You can have late harvests that are, you know, 12, 13%. Some of them can be higher, of course. Typical varieties, you know, Pinot Gris, Viognier, Muscat of Alexandria. I wouldn't pay attention to that. It could literally be anything. You could make a late harvest of anything. But for this, typically fermentation is arrested or forced to stop abruptly by either uh, temperature, so you can chill the tank very, very, very cold where nothing really wants to operate, and or you can sterile filter. You can filter, get all the microorganisms out of the wine so that way nothing is there to ferment anything. Okay, port style wines. These are also harvested very late to attain the highest amount of sugars, of course. Uh, it is typically fortified with brandy or wine spirits. Like I said, this is a port style. Um, only Portugal or people who are grandfathered in to calling their wine port in the United States can call it port. That is like a, a right res reserved for Portugal, just like Champagne only comes from Champagne Hills of France. So that's kind of something that they reserve. Typically for these wines, high alcohol and high sugar. Uh, the alcohol will arrest the fermentation so that you are left with some residual sugar. Otherwise, uh, the yeast will ferment into completion. So, I don't know if you remember from my previous lecture, I mentioned that fermentation becomes very, very difficult for yeast when alcohol hits above 15%. So that's, you know, that's when you see that brandy coming in to help that, help stop that. Okay. Late harvest botrytized wine. So botrytis is also known as noble rot. It is a fungus that attacks fruit. When your strawberries start to mold in the fridge or your, you know, your fruit starts to mold, that is botrytis, quite literally. Uh, and most of the time we'll throw out our fruit when we see that, but in the case of some winemaking styles, it is actually um, really valued. So botrytis and grapes, uh, will transform the flavors to more of like honey characteristics, but it also um, like kind of it uh, dehydrates the berries and it concentrates the sugars and flavors. So um, there's you don't want them all to be insanely covered in botrytis or attacked by this. You actually have to um, go through and cut some of the rot out, and you're not gonna get sick. You don't get sick from this. I mean, it's a fermented product. You, you know, you're drinking fungus and mold like. It gets filtered, so you you know you'll be you'll be fine, I promise. But if you'd like to learn more about it, it's actually a very expensive and really intricate process. I have a couple of um, videos posted here on YouTube about noble rot, and then also um, we have a wine spectator article about botrytis as well. So very cool. Sauternes are very popular too, as well. Um, it's a very sweet wine uh, from Bordeaux. It's also made with botrytis uh, fungi. It can be aged up to 100 years. It starts with a light golden color and it darkens with age, of course. Last but not least, ice wines. Ice wines are made by harvesting frozen. That's, that's the, t that's the um, appeal of that. It is a very expensive procedure. Um, the process, the thought process behind this is that, the science behind this is not just a thought, is that the water in the berries actually freezes, leaving the sugars behind. So at this point, the grapes are harvested when they're frozen, they're pressed, the ice is still solid in those grapes, and all the juice is pressed out and extracted, and then you have this product of, you know, like a low alcohol sweet wine that is just like insanely sweet and um you know these make very good wines you know and typically come in very small skinny bottles very expensive uh very low yield from these of course but very good wines uh these are not infected with botrytis 
unlike some of the other wines that we've talked about. Um, these are just concentrated sugars through freezing. Freezing, because water has a lower freezing point than sugar does. So that's the science behind that. So yeah, if you'd like to learn more about ice wine, I have a Wikipedia link here. Uh, I know they're not the best for everything, but um, I did read this link and it was very um, up-to-date and correct from uh, my point of view. So yeah, that's a little bit about winemaking, the science and chemistry behind it, the, all of, so just some, you know, a fraction of the, all of all of the wines. Now there's lots, lots more wines out there, styles and procedures, but if you're interested in learning more, definitely take my winemaking class. Um, I believe it's going to be offered online again uh, because it's, it's become very popular. It's also going to be in person. If you do live near Placerville, I definitely recommend taking it in person because you actually get to make wine in the lab. Um, but if, like I've said, if you're if you live far away or um, you know you have a conflicting schedule, online works really well too. So if you're really a, you know a chemistry nerd and you want to learn more about the intricacy of the actual winemaking process, definitely take Vidi 308. It's a great class. Very good class. Um, but anyways, I hope you guys learned something new. I'll keep you guys posted about some quizzes and some assignments I'm going to be making here shortly, and um, you know we'll get back on track. Well, we are on track. I'm just tired. I'm sorry. Excuse me. And um, yeah, I look forward to um, chatting with you guys next week. All right, stay safe, stay sane, and I'll see you guys next time.